Do you remember Moses coming down from Mount Sinai, having received the Ten Commandments? The Bible says he was glowing in the dark. Uh, Perhaps something we could all aspire to. You're on Vision. It's Neil with you. It is the Thursday edition of 2020. And a conversation over this next hour, you might like to join into. You might have your own thoughts around the concept of your kingdom come. You know, one of the best known passages in the Bible is the one where Jesus taught his disciples to pray. He said, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Well, we're going to turn our attention today to the powerful prayer, Your kingdom come. Sometimes we rattle through a prayer like that without giving thought to the profound depth of what we just said to God. Well, our special guest today, Andrew Stone, founded Stone Creative Group for leaders to converge their passion and clarity personally and professionally. He's a leadership development and communications consultant for the education sector, for universities, the Australian Defence Force, faith-based communities, leadership colleges and not-for-profit organisations both here in Australia and overseas. He's just as comfortable in the boardroom as he is on the platform in large auditoriums helping leaders bring heaven to earth. Andrew Stone, a special welcome along to 2020. Thank you so much, Neil, and, a, and, and just a, such a privilege to be with all the listeners as well. Hey, Andrew, when we talk the Lord's Prayer and those yes. words, your kingdom come, mm-hmm. uh, I've just said in that introduction, sometimes we just rattle through that. We don't yeah. take time to stop and reflect. Mm. Uh, is this something you've stopped to reflect on, that this is actually a powerful, just a few words, mm. but right there in the middle of the Lord's Prayer? It's it's actually quite astounding because when you read the prayer like that, you actually realize Jesus didn't really come to just start a new religious system. He actually came to establish a kingdom. And in a kingdom or king's domain or dominion, there's a relationship, there are, there's a culture, there's a clarity behind all of that. There's a way of living in that kingdom, not just it's not just paper. It's not just on, you know, the rules that you follow, but there's actually a way of life in the kingdom. And it's not just a religious way of life. It's actually a holistic, integrated way of life. Uh, I sometimes reflect on the thought of kingdom and uh, castles. Uh, mm. You know how the, Dis- the Disney castle uh, almost... You know, it's because it's mystical and it's mm. it's animated and it's, you know, a cartoon. And sometimes we get the impression that the kingdom of God is a little bit like the Disney kingdom, just a little bit like a cartoon. <laughs> Actually, the kingdom of God mm. uh, says that, you know, we talk about Jesus as mm. king, but, you know, God the heavenly father as king, the coming kingdom. Yep. Um, this is not a cartoon expression this is this is the reality the kingdom actually has teeth it actually yes. is substantial yes. and uh, it's something that we aspire to when mm. we come to Christ yes. uh, do, what do, how do you think of kingdom like that well i actually totally agree i think so many times we we when we hear a word what we do is we define it through our lived experience so i hear a word i hear a phrase and suddenly i make a picture of it and so if i say and this is when i do a lot of leadership Uh, consulting or especially around culture is names, words mean something because they, they bring up a visual representation in someone's imagination. So if I were to say to you coffee or to all the listeners coffee, there are multiple iterations of, Hey, my coffee is a, it's a, you know, a a long black or it's a, it's a double shot latte with caramel or whatever it is. And I mean, for some, you know, Um, I grew up in the era before the fancy baristas, so it was Nescafe 43 or International (laughs) Roast, and that was the best we had. And I I think uh, when when we use the terminology kingdom, it can be based on our lived experience, but actually the, the biblical narrative of the kingdom, that's our anchor. What did Jesus say about the kingdom? And he said it a lot. He said, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of heaven looks like, and then even in the parables, really, he gives us glimpses. So I don't think we have to make things up. I think it's actually in Jesus's teachings, what the kingdom actually looks like, sounds like, and feels like. Uh, 
So for Christians, do you think, uh, you've got the international roast kingdom. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> or you've got the expert yeah. barista maid yeah. kingdom. Yeah. And uh, it might be one of those shifts mm. that we have when we think yeah. about kingdom to mm. go from international yes. roast to the barista made model because mm. the barista made model is uh, it's the it's the real McCoy yes absolutely and I think too with with the barista made model when when speaking to leaders in any capacity and and, and to, if you're a listener and you are a mom or, or, or you're a teacher or whatever industry you're in you're leading at least yourself and so for when we're thinking about kingdom and moving from a, let's say, international roast, and I'm not dissing anyone that, you know, drinks international roast. There I, might I be worse. There might be worse brands. There's probably worse. But, <laughs> but if we're going from international roast to barista, it's the same journey that you go from being a cook to a chef. And a cook is reactive. A cook, a cook can do great things with the ingredients that they've been given. And, but it's still reactive. You know, we don't go and pay at restaurants or at least good restaurants to eat from a cook. We want we want to eat from a chef. And the difference is, is cooks are reactive, but chefs are creative. And if I'm a words person, and if you're listening in whichever, um, it, you know, space you're in, whether it's your car or home or wherever, um, if you can write down, write it down. If you're driving, please don't. But I'm a words person, and that's my background. And what you'll realize is reactive and creative have exactly the same letters in it. And I know I'm watching people That's think good. in their mind right now, even though yeah. I can't see your faces, I can almost imagine people's, you know, minds thinking, is he right? I'm going to go type that in. But reactive and creative have exactly the same letters in it, which means we can be given the same ingredients, especially for Christians. You know, we, we have, we have the Bible, we have relationship, we have church community, we have, um, the, the the power of the Holy Spirit. There are so many avenues that we have the same ingredients, yet I can sit in rooms where the same ingredients, people make it either reactive or creative. And because we're, a, a, if I were to look at my leadership consulting um, industry, we, we use the term clarity a lot. And the, in the word create um, reactive, sorry, the C is right in the middle. And that C to me represents clarity. And clarity midway is too late. If clarity is at the forefront, you go from reactive to creative. And we need clarity on what does the kingdom look like here and now. And if you are leading an organization, and let's just uh, bring this right down close to home, uh, leading Mm. your family, uh, leading a small group in your church. Maybe you're leading the youth ministry. Uh, Maybe you're leading the family's ministry in your church. Maybe you've got a business that you're leading. Or maybe you're in some sort of department, middle management, upper management. You're leading something big. Clarity is important because how will your team capture that clarity if you don't have the clarity yourself? So if you've got clarity and you're understanding your kingdom come, Mm. then that clarity can pass on to others who might be looking a little chaotic or confused. Absolutely. And I have so much empathy and care for people that are in the journey of finding that clarity. And I think... You know, my life message, if I had to put it on, a, on in one sentence, is to lead leaders into clarity, enabling them to bring heaven to earth. And your life message is usually the message you wished someone had done for you. So my journey has been being a third generation Christian kid, growing up in church, doing corporate, being in ministry, and now the, the convergence of those two worlds in my ministry element of what I do with not-for-profits, but also the corporate side of things that I do. What you realize is that there's always the journey to clarity, regardless of season. And so I would say to anyone confused or going through chaos, the best time to be creative is during chaos, or you automatically become reactive. And so you've got God who speaks order into the chaos. So when we think about what God does, Mm. uh, he's not the one who's causing the chaos. He's the one who wants to bring order. So when you come with a kingdom mentality Mm. into whatever setting, and you know, you're called into all these different settings that we were talking about, you're looking for what the chaos is Mm. 
and in the clarity that you've found to be able to make an application yes. into that chaos to actually mm. bring some sense of order that will bring some level of flourishing to that organization. Absolutely. And and kingdom is is the the kingdom reality of what God brings in his kingdom is actually marked out in Genesis. Because in Genesis 1 3, which most of us know is let there be light. That's the big moment. But Genesis 1 2 was the chaos and the and and the violence and the instability and and God's spirit is hovering over this and then he says let there be light or let the one who is light shine and what you realize is that the kingdom reality of the kingdom coming doesn't necessarily mean we fight the darkness it means we bring a solution to the darkness now when you are talking to organizations and you deal with uh, corporates that are mm-hmm. probably far from being Christian mm. yep. uh, and then you're also speaking to churches and not for profit Christian organizations yes. that are Christian yes. you've got these principles that have mm. clearly been shaped in your own life uh, yes. you know third generation Christian mm. kid these things have been shaped in your own life you know uh, Thank you, Lord, for your parents and for your grandparents. They must have passed down some fabulous things to to have clarity around Mm. this. But when you go into that corporate environment, uh, supposing you're at the Defence Department Mm. uh, or, you know, you're talking to uh, a big corporation, um, those principles, you apply them, I'm sure, in a more diplomatic way, but, but those principles don't change. It's principles that come from God that actually help the chaos get resolved in those departments too. Absolutely. Biblical patterns are still the right thing, regardless of whether you use scripture and verse when in a corporate environment. I've learned over time to be able to hold the paradox of sitting in both, that I I don't have to put two hats on every day. I don't go, oh, here's my Christian hat that I'm wearing when I'm speaking to you or to the listeners or to a church community. And then I become a different person on Monday and I put my corporate hat on. Actually, one of the greatest frequencies we can have is actually carrying biblical pattern everywhere we go and being able the, to learn the art of translation and interpretation. And sometimes, and I'm sometimes a bit cheeky in environments like that, is I will quote scripture and just say it is, a, it is an ancient proverb that once said, or there was a great uh, philosopher that said, and that's not compromise, that's actually allowing the, the, the word of God to fill a room. And what's so interesting is I'll have people who most likely have never read the Bible in any way, shape or form, or uh, would even be opposed to Christianity because they're ignorant to what it actually does. They've only read media or they've had a bad experience. They'll come to me and go, oh, I love that saying. Where's it from? Now, when they ask, I'll tell them honestly, <laughs> yeah. but it shocks them because they've never realized, you know, the power of what God's Word can actually do. Wonderful illustrations of what it is to be salt and light Mm. and connecting that with who we are as kingdom people. If Christ is our king, uh, then we are to be salt and light. And it doesn't mean that we're there in the odd setting making a proclamation that's going to get everyone's hackles up and, uh, you know, cause us to have all sorts of dreadful reputations. Mm. But in the day-to-day business of our lives mm. as salt and light, those principles that shape us, shape us in the leadership roles that mm. we take with us everywhere. So when we talk about your kingdom come, it starts with those principles, doesn't it? Those things that have shaped us and then in our regular day-to-day activity, whether that be in church life and for so many listening to our conversation mm. today, in their ordinary Monday to Friday life, mm-hmm. uh, these things carry over. All the time. And I look, I've look. i learned to be able to look at what, I, what could seem mundane, but see it as an opportunity to bring the kingdom everywhere that I go. And to the point, like when you know your calling, and if my calling is to lead leaders into clarity, enabling them to bring heaven to earth, I don't have to quote that before I have a conversation. And to use a barista example, which is always something I love to do, is I remember... Because it's not a job. That's what we've got to understand. The kingdom of heaven is our inheritance, not a job. And it's actually part of our calling to establish it and and to to, to see it to be fruitful, multiply and to fill the earth. And therefore, I'm not looking at, oh, what's what's my checklist today? I'm actually going, no, you've given me a calling that I have to 
live in this kingdom and see it all over and everywhere that I go. And so I remember this story. I was ordering coffee. It was, I don't even remember what the coffee tasted like, but I do remember the experience I had with the barista who I overheard talking to another barista, talking about some of the decisions she particularly had to make around her tertiary education. And my calling is to lead leaders into clarity. So because it's my calling and not my job, I don't turn off. I don't go, oh, she didn't pay for a session or she didn't. I'm listening and I remember drawing out on a napkin of that cafe three questions she had to ask herself before she made an educated, what I would consider intuitive decision for clarity because she was confused and I have a particular calling and gifting to lead leaders to clarity. But that doesn't turn off and on. It's always on. And so when I see the the opportunity, regardless of, I didn't say, what church do you go to or what are you connected to? I just went, here's something that can help you because it's your calling. The kingdom's always there. Well, I want to open our talkback line, and you might be thinking, I'm living in chaos right now. I wonder what Andrew Stone might say into my <laughs> circumstance. And, you know, we're just throwing things open here. Totally. You know, if you've got a yeah. scenario uh, that you're going through and you want to hear from Andrew Stone, uh, you're welcome to call through. You might also have some of your own clarity around what it is to be a kingdom Christian believer who understands what it is. When you are the carrier of the kingdom, you know, wherever Christ is, there is the kingdom. So Mm. wherever you are, there is the kingdom. You might like to call through 1-800-316-316 to join in our conversation today. Andrew Stone's our guest. He founded Stone Creative Group. There is a website, stonecreative.com.au. But your opportunity today to interact with Andrew on 1-800-316-316. Our talkback line is open on 1-800-316-316. You might like to contribute to our conversation today. It's a biblical conversation, but as is often the case here on 2020, those sorts of practical applications of how we think of those biblical things and what they do in the relation to our own day-to-day lives, that is something we're talking about, and you might have your own contribution, 1-800-316-316. Our special guest this hour is Andrew Stone. He's the founder of Stone Creative Group. He works with leaders. He helps leaders find clarity, personally and professionally. And you know what? Uh, leaders often will pay a lot of money <laughs> to have someone help them with that sort of clarity. Your opportunity today to hear from Andrew Stone. Uh, We'll hear any scenarios. You might have a scenario you'd like to run by Andrew. Our talkback line open on 1-800-316-316. Andrew, when we talk kingdom of God, practical applications, what do we understand from maybe some biblical patterns here Mm. uh, to be able to say, well, this is an application works for me today? Great question. I think we're always, when you read the Bible, when you're looking and you're inspired by someone or something or a story, we love story. I'm such a story person, is we then say, how do we translate this into my everyday life? How do I operationalize it? How do I take, because vision in itself is actually quite qualitative, you know, even culture in its very form until it's fully developed is actually, it's just the feel of a place. Has anyone ever said that, you know, listeners, you know, you've walked into a restaurant and it's not that the tables and chairs are amazing, the food's got to be good, but you actually walk in because there's a feel. Uh, Same with a coffee shop. We keep coming back to coffee for some reason, but (laughs) there's a feel. and, And I think that's sometimes where we stay and that can be really frustrating for anyone else that wants to integrate into our world. Because you can only go so far saying, well, I just thought it felt right. You know, how do you interpret that? How do you scale that? And so I remember once I was, I live in Mount Cotton and I was running in the bush with my Labrador dog. You know, his name's Max. He's a big black Labrador. He's actually a breeder for guide dogs. And so my running joke is even our dog has a clear purpose in life. And, and so I'm running with him and I'm trying to solve this, this issue and this challenge that I'm facing with a particular client. And I really resonated. I was running and, and, I, and I was praying. And can I just tell every listener that 
you can be as strategic as and intelligent as anyone, but the Holy Spirit and prayer will unlock things in your life that you couldn't even imagine. And to come back to being spiritual before strategic. So this is not just an intellectual exercise, talking no. about getting clarity mm-hmm. and in relation to the kingdom. We're talking the presence yes. of the Holy Spirit yep. in your life, mm-hmm. interacting with the things that yes. we're involved in, mm-hmm. and uh, perhaps it might even be interacting with our daily devotional yes. and our, our the way we engage with God's Word, mm. even the relationships we might be forming with a pastor in church mm. life. Uh, these sorts of things are helping to bring kingdom purpose. And so some of this clarity is coming through a, a bunch of different dimensions here that yes. we all need if we're going to actually live a life of purpose. Absolutely. And I remember a person where I was speaking at a conference and one of the other guest speakers asked me, what exactly do you do? Because not everything I do can be, just, you know, be it, it. It's quite complex in a sense, but then it's simple. But he said, what do you do? And I just opened my mouth and I said, well, I'm the optometrist to your vision. And if someone presents a vision to me and it's a little bit confusing or blurry, I just philosophically and through the tools that we use can actually probably give quite a clear picture of are you short-sighted, long-sighted, where, where is, what kind of prescription do you need? Um, and so I'm running in the bush and I remember seeing um, this, this, this pattern and it's from Genesis and it's about spirit, soul and body. And the only thing that God said was very good in the garden was the human being, a triune being, and it's made up of spirit, soul, and body. And as soon as I that I had that impression, I could run home, I drew it out, I have a design team, so they drew it out for me, and I realized that in order to live a, a, a successfully kingdom-based clarity life, you have to have a good convergence and, and integration of spirit, soul and body, and not just for a person, but for a whole organisation. We're taking calls on 1-800-316-316. Let's take some. Katie is in Neil in Victoria. Hi, Katie. Welcome. Hi, Katie. Uh, hi, Neil and Andrew. Andrew. How are you? Very good. good. Thank you. What are your Sorry, thoughts Sorry, I haven't here, spoken to you for years. I used to call up a few years ago and I've moved away and then <laughs> come back and listening to Vision again. Sorry. Well, it's good to have you back again, Katie. Thank you. So, what are your um, thoughts here? Yeah. So, hi, Andrew. It's really interesting listening to you. Oh, thank you. Um, good to chat. I I totally agree about the spiritual things first, not saying mm. I always get it right. <laughs> Join the club. Um, I was actually running a, um opal gem and jewellery business, mm-hmm. um, which really took off about three years ago, sort of yes. near the start of COVID. Mm-hmm. I didn't even have a... Um, I haven't even had like a business page. I actually started selling on Facebook. I never wanted to be on Facebook, got Mm -hmm. on there because my kids were on there. And during lockdown, I started doing auctions online. I did set up some groups on there. Um, Anyway, the long and the short of it is it took off. I was actually mainly doing gems, which is something I got into years ago. Um, I started off Fossey King. And then basically God put a business in my lap, if I can say that. Okay. Because I was kind of like what... I would say, confessing this online in front of mm-hmm. too many people, but um, the worst sinner. And I've had a really, like, um, I'm a battler. Okay. Um, I ended up on my own with four children, mm-hmm. um, trying to bring up four children by myself. And it was just something God gave me. I actually started off with rubies was my main thing. And just literally, I cannot explain how God put this business in my lap. It was like miracle after miracle after miracle over a period of about... Wow. Uh, 15 years or something like that. Um, It's been more than 20 years now. So the business took off. Um, One of my children, well, some of my children, but one of my children particularly had a lot of struggles a couple of years ago. Um, Actually, their father passed away. And need to be quick uh, here, Katie, because we're coming up to news. Uh, Was there anything particular you thought? I want to hear from Andrew. What happened is somebody put a video out about me online. Okay. And then I was in the middle of helping my son and I was away from home at the time and it led to me getting trolled online. Okay. Um, just, yeah, st- it's still happening. I'm starting to recover. I took about six months off. Okay, Katie, let's uh, let's deal with some of these thoughts here. Uh, Andrew, when you're hearing Katie's story, um, you know, 
being in business. Yes. God-given business, as, yes. Ka- as Katie is saying. Mm. But, you know, there's challenges that go along that. Can you yes. pick up something here we can uh, talk about with Katie? Yeah, absolutely. I think that her, obviously, her story is, is, is a powerful piece of it, you know, creating this business model and having her own testimony and all of it, but being a resilient leader. And you can see that and hear that in her voice of her own story of, you know, the struggle, but then being able to be fruitful in this business. But I would say to anyone, any leader listening to here, and I knew towards the end of that call, she was talking about some trolling and everything else. When you keep the main thing, the main thing, you are definitely going to have people or attract people that are negative. But if you have a clear purpose, the purpose doesn't change. And you've got to be very resilient and have somewhat of a thick skin because the bigger you get, not the bigger you get, but the more, let's say, influential you get, there's going to be people that are insecure, that don't have clarity. And I always say, if you don't have clarity, you'll be busy pulling someone else's down. So if you're convinced that this is a business given to you mm. by God, mm. um, mm-hmm. stay on track. Yes. Don't waver side to side. No wonder, what, no matter what your critics are saying, yes, that's, that's right. something you can, yeah. as, as a takeaway, yes. and that's a kingdom principle. Of, Absolutely. I mean, look at the children of Israel, mm. uh, the challenges that they have yes. faced as God was shaping a people for himself. Yes, that's right. Katie, thank you so much for your call. We're going to take some more calls after Vision National News. 1-800-316-316 to join in our conversation. 1-800-316-316. We're talking the kingdom of God. More specifically, out of the Lord's Prayer, your kingdom come. What does that mean for us today personally? What does it mean for us corporately? What does it mean for us in church? Back with more with Andrew Stone after news. Wonderful to have you with us on this Thursday edition of 2020. If you're just joining us, joining into a conversation about those words, your kingdom come, and a mixture of some profound truths and some practical application today, you might like to join in our conversation. Our talkback line is open on 1-800-316-316. One of the best known passages of the Bible is the one where Jesus taught his disciples to pray. He said, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Our attention today is on the powerful part of that prayer, Your kingdom come. Sometimes we rattle through that prayer without giving much thought to the profound depth of what we just said to God. Our special guest is Andrew Stone. Andrew founded Stone Creative Group for Leaders to converge their passion and clarity personally and professionally. He's a leadership development and communications consultant for the education sector, for universities. He works with the Australian Defence Force, with faith-based communities, with leadership colleges and not-for-profit organisations, both here and overseas, just as comfortable in the boardroom as he is on the platform in front of large auditoriums. Our talkback line open on 1-800-316-316. Let's take another call before we move any further. Lawrence is in Perth, Western Australia. Hey, Lawrence, welcome along. Oh, thank you for the program this morning. Yes, yeah, so Genesis uh, 1 2, was it? Let there be light uh, out of the chaos. Yes. yes uh, I'm retired now, but um, I've worked uh, for many years in the public service and the, you know, the um, office politics, that sort of thing. Uh-huh. Yeah, and some, someone was there in the same section as I was, and they weren't speaking to someone else for three months, but the manager and the supervisor didn't know what to do either. <laughs> Yeah, so it goes a long way up the chain, doesn't it? So Absolutely. that's probably what you're involved in. Yeah, so, and it happens in churches too. People, mm. you know, haven't, something happens and some of family leaves or something. So it's everywhere, isn't it? Yeah, mm. so these things are, are common in our chaotic world, aren't they? So thanks for your program this morning. I don't have a question, just a comment, really. Great, mm. Lawrence. Well, you've raised something really important, and we'll mm. get Andrew's thoughts here because when you talk about office politics, and you said yes. you were working in the public service, and then you said, you know, there's church politics too. And we're often finding ourselves mm. in chaos at work, yes. chaos even in church sometimes. Mm. Uh, thoughts here for Lawrence from you, Andrew. Well, firstly, thank you, Lawrence, for the call. And I just, it's so great to be on this program with Neil and being able to speak into your world and the leadership uh, journey you've been on. Chaos 
can be solved when you bring clarity to it. But it has to be intentional. And I think in business politics, office politics, whatever, wherever there's chaos, even in a household, so if your home feels a bit chaotic, one of the greatest things to do, like um, what God did in the beginning, was to not fight against the chaos, but to bring a solution. And Brene Brown, the writer and speaker, says, clear is kind. And if you were to break down the wording in, you know, the, the Spirit of God hovered upon the waters, etc. in Genesis 1-2, what you really break down Genesis 1-2 is that the Spirit of God grew soft on and in behalf of the emptiness, the instability, and the violence. And when I say violence, we're not talking about physical violence, but we're talking about lack of peace. And so when there's a lack of peace or instability or emptiness, what happens is, is that God's heart doesn't fight it. He feels it and then brings a solution. And I think that's one of the things is rather than fight the politics, you understand why are they even going on? Who's insecure? What, what chaos are they bringing in? And what solution can I bring then to it? Bringing light. Lawrence, Thank you so much for great insight today and raising something so important because uh, inevitably in mm. any organization, yeah. uh, you've got people coming into it yes. afresh and they're coming in with their own values. Mm-hmm. They're coming in with their own culture. Mm. They haven't necessarily adopted your culture mm. yet. When you've got a culture that's growing in your workplace, yes. kingdom culture, let's call mm. it, yep. uh, then that kingdom culture, then as everyone catches a hold of it, then you've got the possibility for mm. harmony until yes. you've got something where you acknowledge that the king is higher than mm. the boss, the king yes. is higher than the politics, you can't actually work towards that harmony, can you? Uh, no, no, you can't, because unless you can uh, bring clarity and define what the culture actually is, people will live in the assumed reality of what they think the culture is. And very often they make it up as they go along. Like I said right in the beginning was coffee and coffee. So when someone says we're a friendly organization, well, friendly compared to you might not be friendly compared to me. Um, And therefore the definitions have to be isolated to, hey, when you come into this organization, culture sounds like something, feels like something and looks like something. But what does that actually mean? Thank you so much, Lawrence in Perth. Our talkback line is open on 1-800-316-316. We're talking about your kingdom come. You might have your own thoughts or you might have a scenario. You might be thinking, my life's in chaos right now. How would I look for some clarity in there? Interestingly, coming back to the disciples, Mm. and because it was the disciples who said to Jesus, uh, teach us how to pray. Yes. And uh, and so they might have been spending time with Jesus. Mm-hmm. They might have been picking up some things around mm-hmm. around the traps. Yes. They might have been seeing all of those amazing miracles that Jesus was doing. Uh, what are your thoughts here around this question the disciples ask about how do we pray? Firstly, I just love their humility. They're not they're actually asking which which is actually part of the kingdom culture is actually humility saying I'm seeing something that's on your life that I haven't figured out yet. Can you teach me? And I've now done multiple succession plans, worked in what you'd consider multi-generational and intergenerational organizations. That's one of the greatest gifts of kingdom culture is humility. And therefore, looking at the way they ask the question is quite profound because they've seen all these miracles. They've seen Jesus do wonderful things, yet they don't say, how do you do a miracle? They say, how do you pray? And, and therefore they've seen something that's, they see the outworking because sometimes we want the end result, Jesus. And they, they were intuitive enough and instinctive enough to say, no, there's, there's a, there's something that is the source of that great outworking. Like I say, spirit before strategy. And they asked, what do you do? And how do you pray? And Jesus opens up the prayer with our father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And that, that before it goes any further into the Lord's Prayer, which we know, you realize that he's showing them who their, what their identity is, what their inheritance is, and where they have to integrate that inheritance. So their identity comes from our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. There's a name that defines us. There's a, there's a family that we're a part of. And that kingdom and that king is actually also our Father. So we have a royal lineage and royal identity. He then explains that the kingdom is our inheritance. 
So I'm not looking at the worldly things going, oh, I need it. No, there's a kingdom uh, access that I have. And then the integration is on earth as it is in heaven. It means you can't just say, well, I'm part of the kingdom and I have a kingdom culture, but I don't integrate that into my earthly roles and my earthly leadership. You know, just a short while ago, you were talking about body, soul, and spirit. Yes. And taking that all the way back to Genesis mm. and talking about the way that we might even integrate a practical way yes. of making body, soul, and spirit come alive yes. comes back to prayer. Absolutely. Now, that sounds simplistic, mm. but when we're talking about prayers like this, your kingdom come, this actually connects the dots, doesn't it? Absolutely. And we... What my, I mean, my hope after this is people can go and look at their workplace with new eyes. They can walk into their home and see it with a new perspective of, I'm not trying to separate all these silos in my life, but I can be fully kingdom and fully corporate all at the same time. And that is integrating uh, spirit, soul, and body, or in a corporate terminology, I would use instinct, intuition, and intelligence. Let's take another call. Yeah, let's do it. Brett is in Western Australia. Hi, Brett. Welcome. G'day, hey, Brett. Thanks for having me. What are your thoughts? Um, yeah, just a quick one. Um, we talking about the kingdom being here now. Is that correct? Yes, I think uh, that you know your kingdom come. There is a present kingdom, and I think people talk about a soon coming kingdom, so a future kingdom. So there's lots of different ways I think we can define mm. kingdom, and uh, I think you'll probably agree with that, Andrew. But what yes. are your thoughts here, Brett? Um, well, the question would be: if the kingdom is here now, then how would it be possible that the kingdom is yet to come in, like the dispensationalist theology of the thousand-year reign? Okay, well, uh, my perspective would be that uh, when Jesus arrived, and sometimes we talk about the incarnation, you know, the importance of Christmas Day, the king arrives and the kingdom is here. And you had John the Baptist talking about, you know, the kingdom is at hand. Uh, so you've got the kingdom wherever the king is, so you have Christ within. So wherever we go, we carry with us the kingdom. And yet you have the future kingdom because, you know, the king revealed in his wholeness, uh, in his fullness, is still ahead. Uh, does that uh, make sense? What are your thoughts here, Andrew? Um, firstly, uh, great question. And I would like to say Charles Fuller, the the founder of Fuller Theological Seminary in California, talks about the paradox of the kingdom. He says, we're in the now and the not yet kingdom, which is really, I mean, sometimes we like to look for contradictions, but actually there's quite a few paradox in the Bible. And when it comes to, and there's a great book, and I'd refer you to um, N.T. Wright's book, is Surprised by Hope. And that actually breaks down a real life kind of, what does what does the kingdom mean now? but also what does the fullness of the kingdom potentially look like um, in that whole you know, journey ahead of what the end times and all that narrative is, is it's a great narrative and a great book, Surprised by Hope by N.T. Wright. Brett, is that helpful? Um, yeah, just um, in, in relation to that, though, uh, faith is something that is needed now to be in the kingdom um, if the kingdom is to come in a thousand year reign and it's full and complete there would be no faith would that be correct um, I don't think there's going to be a limit there and uh, I think when we talk about the kingdom now uh, the kingdom is where the king is so when we when we actually talk about uh, being a Christian believer and the indwelling uh, presence of the Holy Spirit, uh, who is the third member of the Trinity. So Christ lives within, as does the Holy Spirit, and does the Heavenly Father as well. There's a certain sense in which uh, Trinity we don't separate. So wherever the King is, the Kingdom is, my suspicion is this gets confusing when we think that um, we know that the kingdom is within us, but there's got to be a practical expression. We don't have the practical expression until we understand the power of what kingdom mm. is and what kingdom does. Uh, anything further to add to that at all, Andrew? I would really just ask the question of Brett, is, is what around that thousand year reign is for you so important that you would like clarity on? 
Um, well, in the teaching of the dispensationalist theology, it teaches that this thousand-year reign is yet to come, mm. and it would then potentially change the gospel aspect of faith if the Lord reigns on earth in full glory for that thousand-year period. And it would mean that faith is still on earth and that people can still be saved and enter the kingdom um, and all of that in that time period. But my point would be that if it's then, why couldn't it be now? I think we're getting into some finer points of different ways that we might interpret eschatology, those teachings about the end of time. Mm. Uh, Dispensationalism breaks up the history of the world into something like seven dispensations. And for listeners who are thinking about how all that works, uh, of course, uh, a dispensation that might be right at the end um, and a thousand year reign and will people still be able to get into that? Uh, I think the proclamation of our gospel, uh, and you could even say the gospel of the kingdom, is about uh, turn and turn away from those things of the world today and actually accept and participate in the kingdom. Now, mm. just remember uh, some of the parables that Jesus told about the kingdom. He said the kingdom is like a treasure that's hidden in a field. And when you've got the fields, um, your choice is this. Mm. Don't do anything at all and leave the treasure in the field or do everything you can to buy the field so that you will have the treasure. Mm-hmm. Said, the, said the same thing about the pearl of great yeah. price. Yes. Do everything you can to buy the treasure, to buy the pearl, mm. because that is a parable of the kingdom. So yes. the kingdom is accessible. And we need to participate in and take the kingdom now and not worry so much about what, the end time yeah. way that God works might might look. Is, is that helpful at all, Brett? Yeah, thank you. Um, it's just, it, it, it's sort of, um, I've had some dramas with speaking to some uh, unbelievers in relation to um, what they've been told about the end times and they've <laughs> refused to partake in the kingdom now because they believe it is pointless if, if you can't be in that kingdom then because the kingdom is like as in the Jew Gentile scenario. So the kingdom is actually for the Jews in that um, process of that thousand year reign thing. So it's sort of, it, it's muddled up what I would teach as um, mm. faith and being in the kingdom now. And it's sort of changed it into something that's yet to come. And I don't believe that it could even be the case because faith would need to still be in existence for one to be saved. Um, But yet if God is here in full glory, there would be no faith because he is present. and You don't need faith when you know and see something. It's absolute. I think we always come back to the scripture, Brett, and recognize that when Jesus is talking about parables of the kingdom, he's talking about the kingdom now. And that's first Mm, century. And the kingdom has been here all along. And, uh, you know, on that day of Pentecost, uh, when the Holy Spirit was poured out and uh, and people were filled with the Holy Spirit, uh, they were then carriers of this kingdom as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. So, Brett, thank you so much for your call. Uh, there is another opportunity, still a few more minutes, 1-800-316-316, if you'd like to join in our conversation. And, uh, you know, that one's a little bit challenging because, you know, there's different things that people say about eschatology. Absolutely. Clarity in that is obviously coming back to wor- the words I get of it Jesus. all the time. And like I said, you know, third generation Christian kid, you know, every, we were all scared in 1999 because there was the millennium coming. There was just so much stuff. And I just keep coming back to um, that, that there's always a hope for the future. And if we just bring the kingdom here and now, uh, it will reveal itself as it comes not not that we can't have great theology and i i love great theology but for the person that's at work and everything else they're not thinking about that they're thinking about i need a kingdom reality now they're not thinking about in a you know 2000 years what's going to happen and and i think too we've got to be really and, and if i can say this with the deepest respect for everyone who loves researching all that stuff is i'm actually occupied with the message of Jesus now and his first coming rather than being preoccupied with his second. And I think that is a heart posture of people that want to see the kingdom here and now 
we're not going to miss out on anything in the future if we focus on what his message was, which was the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And oftentimes, when you have differing perspectives on eschatology, those Mm. teachings about the end of days, Uh, that can become contentious and uh, it can lots of tensions in all of that and then becomes a distraction from, Mm. as you're saying here, Andrew, what comes back to what Jesus taught about Mm. the kingdom. And so I think that's quite clear. The kingdom is here. Jesus brought the kingdom and uh, and uh, we are actually a part of that kingdom today as Mm. we are believers Mm. on the Lord Jesus Christ. Absolutely. Interesting. Nearly out of time. Um, Around, um, let's get practical here. Yes. Uh, you're in an organization. Mm-hmm. We, we said earlier, could be your family, could mm-hmm. be a small group that you're leading, yes. could be your church, could be the business, could be a big corporation that you're, you're in charge of. It starts, I guess, mm-hmm. when you're looking to create kingdom culture mm-hmm. with how the leaders think about kingdom. Yes. Kingdom culture needs to somewhat be the epicenter. If you're a kingdom leader, kingdom culture should be the epicenter, whether you use Bible scripture verse or not, because that is our inheritance. That's actually where we, that's our home. You know, we're seated in heavenly places. And here's a paradox. We're seated in heavenly places, yet I'm sitting here in Vision FM talking to you, Neil. Mm, And we have to be able to be okay with tension in the scriptures. We have to be okay to be in the paradox of, I can see the fullness of the kingdom in my workplace and also know that I'm going to have access to more tomorrow and, and later. And, and with kingdom culture, if I can, if I make it really practical and when I do workshops on culture, we call it a culture lab lab being an acronym for language, attitude, and behavior language. What does it sound like attitude? What does it feel or think like and behavior? What does it look like practically? And the kingdom culture actually has that. It has a language, it has an attitude, and it has a behavior. And therefore, when you integrate that into your family, in your life, into your business, you have to be able to take what does the Bible say about the kingdom, what does Jesus say about the kingdom, and what does that look like outworked in my family, my small group, my church, my marketplace, but then bring definitions so people can actually understand what does that mean and what does that sound like, and what should that feel like? If you have a deeper revelation of kingdom, then putting that in words for others to understand yes. is going to be a way that you build mm. the culture mm-hmm. in your organization. Yes. Let's take, we'll squeeze in one more call. Okay, let's Bev, do it, Neil. Bev is in Queensland. Hi, Bev. Hi, Neil. Neil, thank you for this, this opportunity. I'm not sure whether this ta- totally fits with where you're at, but I, I really thank you for your answers you've had just a minute ago. I really appreciated that. But I, I grew up in a time when this nation was under grace, and under grace we had responsibilities. Mm. And in, in about the 70s we become under law, and under law we have rights, and I feel that's what's destroyed our nation. Uh, you're talking issues of the heart here, I think, Bev. Andrew, what are your thoughts for Bev? Absolutely. I am a, 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 I am the recipient of grace. I understand what it means to be saved by grace. And I also am very careful. One of my great mentors in life is Bob Mendelson, who's a, the director of Jews for Jesus Australasia. I've been on the journey with him for 14 years now. And I remember being, like I said, that third generation kid in church and saying something to him one day about law and grace. And he said to me, he pulled back, he's like a sage. He's my Obi-Wan Kenobi, if you like Star Wars. And he said to me, he said, Andrew, you can make anything a law, anything a law. He said, and this is, I believe it'll set some people free listening to this, is every day, if you were to see your works and your efforts, and there's there's a heavenly FPOS machine, or a credit card machine, and every day you wake up and you put a filter on in your mind that God will like me if, or God will love me if, and you put your own credit card on that machine, and this is back in the day where you still had to swipe it, and he said, and you'd swipe it, and I've been a university student before, and you freak out in that moment of, is it going to become approved or not? That fear is the bondage again to fear, as it says in Romans 8. The bondage again to fear is, am I or have I done enough to be approved by God? Whereas he says to me, he goes, you can make that uh, that up about anything, your prayer life, what you do, what you say. He said, but 
in the finished work of Jesus under grace is it wasn't your credit card. That's why when we pray our Father, hallowed be your name, we're actually not using our credit card. We're using his new family name. And that comes through the finished work of Jesus and the power of his resurrection. Bev, I want to thank you so much for raising a very good point there. And we do have to put a line under calls now uh, because our conversation has to uh, wind up. Let me put listeners uh, in a place where they can connect with you, Andrew. Yeah. Uh, your organization is called Stone Creative. Uh, the website, stonecreative.com.au. Stonecreative.com.au. Uh, you're the founder of the Stone Creative Group. Uh, leaders converging their passion and clarity personally and professionally. Uh, Andrew, can people book you? I mean, do you Absolutely. do uh, you like Zoom sessions? And, yes. Uh, you know, because I, you can't be everywhere all at once. <laughs> but um, I know you travel a lot too, mm. and people, yeah. no doubt, they might be able to get a hold of your itinerary if you're traveling. Yes. And uh, how do I connect with Andrew Stone? Well, uh, there's your opportunity to connect today. Stonecreative.com.au. Stonecreative.com.au. Andrew? Let's plan to do this again sometime Absolutely. soon. There's I'd so much to. more to unpack, but thank you for being with us on Twitter. Thank you so much, Neil, and to thank you all the listeners. I look forward to the days ahead. 